Hallelujah, we're going to stand together, we're going to worship Jesus in this place. Come on, listen. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder? Who leaves his reverence in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. That you would take my place. Yeah. That you would bear my cross, you, you would lay down your life, where I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Oh, come on, say, who brings our chaos? Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Oh, who rules every nation? Who rules the nation? Who truth and justice shine like the sun in all of its brilliance? The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. So fell in love, sin and fell in love. That you would, that you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. That I would be set free. All that you've done for me. Oh, come on, we declare, worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered them. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered them. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. We sing, worthy, worthy, worthy. This is amazing grace. I'm falling in love. That you will, that you will, that you will take my place. Oh, 
Jesus, oh the Lord, and the end, and the answer. That's why I trust Him. That's why I trust Him. I saw the Lord, and the end, and the answer. I saw the Lord, and the end, and the answer. The Lord, and the end, and the answer. We're so grateful that we're able to come into a place, God, exalting your name and your freedom. God, we're so grateful, uh, Lord, to be able to stand here and declare that you are a faithful God, uh, that you are a trustworthy God, uh, that you will never leave us uh, nor forsake us, that you are there for us in our time of need, in our desperation. Uh, God, we are so grateful to be able to come into a place, uh, God, and lift our hands, uh, God, in solidarity, uh, God, in uh, God, in uh, just an attitude of praise and worship, God. God, as a body of believers, as a church, as a whole, God, that we have the freedom to do so. God, what a privilege it is. God, I pray right now that you would just, uh, God, uh, uh, pour out your spirit. God, you would touch our lives. God, in this place, Lord, in this city, Lord, in this church, God, we are just believing for miracles. God, we are believing for salvations in this place. God, you would bring the lost into here, into this place. God, you would bring in those that are broken. God, those that are hurt. God, those who feel hopeless. God, bring them into this place. God, let them know your love. God, let them know 
your hope. God, let them know your restoration power. God, we are praying for and believing for great things. God, and we want to see it. God, we are claiming it. God, we are, God, just believing for it. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for all that you've done. God, all that you're doing and all that you're going to do, we so look forward to it. In your wonderful name, Jesus, all of God's children said amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So good to be in the house of the Lord. Why don't we take a minute or two and greet one another before we're seated. Check, check. I just went to here. Check. <laughs> you, you know why? Because we're using one speaker. Everybody turn their mics off. Check, test. Amen. Why don't we go ahead and find our seats uh, this evening? I don't have much time, so you guys have to help me out here finding your seats. I appreciate you being here. Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, does anybody, just very quickly, I see my wife standing there in the uh, entryway. Does anybody need a bulletin? Just lift your hand. And my lovely bride will run one to you. Tara needs one. Austin needs one. Uh, Chance, you need one too? Do you lift your hand? Or are you just reaching for your drink? Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> All right. So uh, good to have a bulletin. It kind of keeps you updated. Um, uh, every uh, Sunday as well, we put an old hymn and the story of the old hymn. This uh, morning, it was I Stand Amazed. Uh, some some people know it as How Marvelous, so wonderful hymn, wonderful stories behind these hymns, so you can keep that. Also, ladies, uh, uh, Bible study will be April the 2nd, and so I encourage you to uh, make note of that, uh, going through the practice of godliness, and, <clears throat> and so I encourage you to, um, again, put that on your calendar this uh, Wednesday. We will be uh, eating together, uh, we'll, we might have a couple of songs of worship, and uh, but then we're going to be eating together. I think uh, the menu is sausage lasagna, uh, at least that's what I was told I was cooking. So, uh, so anyway, you come, and we're going to be praying for Abby and Adrian as they uh, leave out for California on Thursday. And uh, so uh, launching them into destiny, and so I'm so uh, obviously mixed emotions, sad, but uh, really excited for all that God's going to do. 
uh, in uh, their lives. And so that'll be this Wednesday, 7 o'clock. I uh, encourage you to come. Uh, we are going to have a Good Friday service, and that is the 29th of March. And so I encourage you to uh, just, again, put it on your calendar. We'll be here Friday, uh, 7 o'clock, and, and then um, Easter Sunday as well. Um, and um, we are having an Easter play Sunday morning, Sunday night. It's a two-part play. So if you want to be a part of that, there's a sign-up sheet in the back foyer. And so you can uh, sign up on that and then let uh, Dennis and Don know so they uh, know uh, what they're working with. If you sing, um, not if you think you can sing, but if you sing um, or if you want to have a speaking part, uh, then uh, just uh, let them know. And uh, so a lot, a lot of good things happening. And so, again, hang on to your calendar and uh, we'll uh, keep announcing as we go. Uh, we want to have the ushers come. Uh, this evening, uh, we want to continue to support uh, our church in Uruguay and believe God for a continued revival there. Also, we want to continue to pray. Did, did I say, can, did I ask the ushers to come? I, did I just say that or no? Oh, okay, okay, nobody was coming. I'm like, did I? I thought I said it. But, you know, short-term memory, man, you know, it's like, I don't know. I, I definitely doubt myself. But, um, and we want to continue to pray for uh, what's going on in Israel and uh, believing God for uh, just revival there in Tel Aviv, uh, that God would move in Pastor Bobby and uh, Sister Carrie's uh, ministry there. Um, You know, October 7th in Israel was kind of like their 9-11 that happened here. I remember 9-11, I was pastoring in Salt Lake City, and, you know, the church was full for about a month, and, uh, you know, then everybody forgot, um, you know, (laughs) Because, you know, once we, our troubles leave us, many times we forget uh, how we made it through. And so, uh, but what's happening in Tel Aviv is that these people are coming in and they are locking in uh, to the congregation. Pastor Stevens told me that before October 7th, they had minimal, they had only a few people coming, a few people responding to the gospel. And then after October 7th, uh, uh, all of the tragic things that happened there, many, many people began to respond and give their lives to Jesus. And so excited to be a part of that. Uh, If you ever want to give, which we have given, uh, and we send the money right to Pastor Stevens, and he said, hey, everything that comes in helps uh, the church there in Tel Aviv. So I want to encourage you if you want to do that. you know, we believe that Jesus loves everybody. Amen. We believe that he wants to see everybody know him. And so it's so uh, such a privilege to be able to be a part of what God's doing around the world here in our own city as well. And so anyway, you uh, pray tonight. We're going to believe God to bless you as you give. If you want to give online, all the ways are there on the screen uh, beside me, the ways to give online. And so uh, you uh, you pray tonight as we pray and ask God what he would have you do. Why don't you bow your heads uh, with me uh, this evening. Uh, Leonard, you lift your voice, bless the gift and giver. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Uh, appreciate you uh, again being here this evening. Why don't you open your Bibles to 1 Samuel? We're going to continue our uh, series that we started this morning. Um, before I get into the Word, I read a couple of little jokes that I want to uh, share with you, and you can just you know, bear with my third grade sense of humor. I thought it was, uh, I thought they were funny, uh, but uh, I read this, and it says, uh, an old, old man, an old man uh, wrote this. He said, I was in line at McDonald's, and the lady behind me laid on her horn and was speaking obscenities, I guess because I was taking too long to order. When I came to the first window, I paid for my food and the lady's food behind me. 
As we moved up to the up, the worker must have told her what I did because she, she yelled out the window, thank you, thank you. When I got up to the second window, I showed the cashier both receipts and took my food and hers. Don't mess with an old man in line at McDonald's. <laughs> and just one more. Uh, what do elephants and hippo hippos reveal to us? That walking a lot and eating salad is not the key to weight loss. All right. So third grade sense of humor. Help me out, y'all. First uh, Samuel chapter 22. I uh, preached a message this morning entitled Commitment to the Cave. And I'm going to read our key text here in chapter 22. I'm not going to re-preach this morning, but I'm going to move on to my second point. But I will recap. Uh, verse 1, so David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam, or Adullam, however you want to pronounce it. So soon his brothers and his other relatives joined him there. Then others began coming, men who were in trouble, in debt, or who were just discontented, until David was the captain of about 400 men. Later, David went to Mizpah in Moab, where he asked the king, please allow my father and mother to live here with you until I know what God is going to do for me. So David's parents stayed in Moab with the king during the entire time David was living in the cave or in the stronghold. Uh, Luke chapter 4, we'll just read these two verses, verse, uh, or uh, this one verse, verse 18. Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the recovery of sight to the blind, and set at liberty those who are oppressed. And one of the, uh, the keys to my thought this morning and throughout this week uh, up to Wednesday, uh, obviously we're not going to have a service Wednesday, but uh, hopefully you'll gather what I'm trying to communicate uh, tonight, uh, is that David, what da what's happening with David is he is planting a church. He is pioneering a church. He is in a cave. And when he gets in the cave, all these broken down, broken hearted, discontented, in debt. I don't know if you can relate to any of these things. Uh, all of these people uh, begin to gather with David. And I love what uh, Pastor Paul Stevens said. He said, everyone is worthy of an opportunity to be restored. And I refuse uh, to take on the uh, image that much of the world and even much of the church world places on the church. That somehow we're a place of entertainment. Or we're a place to come and make you feel good. We're a place to come and just find a few things, make you feel good about yourself. Uh, Folks, I refuse that because when I came into church, uh, when I was 19 years old, that pastor absolutely did not make me feel good. Amen. He said, look, you need Jesus uh, or you're not going to make heaven your home. You need to repent of your sin. And the more I went to church, the more I heard that and the more I didn't feel good about myself because I needed to repent of my sin. I needed to stop walking in open rebellion. Listen, when you sin and you know it's not the Word of God and you know it's against God, I'm sorry to tell you, but you are being rebellious. Oh, y'all missed a good place to say amen, Pastor. Folks, all of us, when we sin willingly, knowing that it is not the plan of God and knowing that God isn't pleased and we do it anyway. So listen, but here's the reality is that we must stay committed to the cave. 
I said this morning I may change the name of our church to Charleston Christian Fellowship Cave. Because this is the cave and we are the cave dwellers. And if we're going to see people's lives restored, which is what the church is all about, it's all about helping people's lives be restored, then we are going to have to be committed to the cave. Be committed to the cave dwellers. And so one of the things that I dealt with, my, my only point this morning, was the challenge of staying committed. The challenge of staying committed through our crisis and staying committed to the cave in other people's crisis. Just because your crisis is over doesn't mean that you can leave the cave. Doesn't mean that you no longer need the cave or the dwellers in the cave. So I asked the question this morning, are you the church or do you just go to church? Because if you're the church, then you are living a life, not just a restored life, but you're living a life wanting to restore others. Wanting to be a blessing, not just blessed, not just forgiven, but wanting to help others be forgiven. That's the church. We don't just go to church. We are the church. And I looked up this word agilum, and agilum has no real positive definition from what anyone could find. But what it represents is it represents a place of hiding, a place of refuge, a place of hope, and a place of transition. And see, folks, that's what the house of God is. It's a place of transition where you're able to come in one way and transition into who God desires you to be. So I, so I dealt with this idea. You can listen to the sermon if you got time on your own time. Uh, just go to our YouTube page. Actually, I don't even know if we put it up there. The sound was all jacked up this morning. So if you missed it, you missed it. Oh, well, life, life's tough. And uh, so, but I dealt with the challenge. And so tonight, I want to deal with uh, the chance in the cave. And when I say chance, I don't just mean you get another chance, uh, because I do believe that everyone deserves an opportunity to be restored into destiny. But what I'm talking about, Chance, is in the cave, as cave dwellers, there's always a risk. You always take a chance when you make a friend in the cave. Because <laughs> they are as jacked up as you are. We are all saved by grace, and without the grace of God, we are, we are a mess. And that's a compliment. See, everyone who comes into the cave and we begin to build relationships, there is a risk. But here's the reality of the cave, is you have to see beyond the problem in order to see the potential. If you can't see beyond the problem, you're going to have a problem helping anyone out of their problem. If all you can see is their problem, their issue, their weaknesses, you have to be able to see beyond the problem in order to see the potential. This is what they said about me then, one man says. You have a poor build. You're too skinny. You lack great physical stature and strength. You lack mobility to avoid the rush. You lack a really strong arm. You can't drive the ball downfield. You don't throw a really tight spiral. System-type players who can get exposed, it will force you to ad-lib. You get knocked down easily. That was the report on Tom Brady coming out of college. 
But somebody said, I'm going to look past the problem and I'm going to see the potential. Folks, I don't know what's happened to the church over the last 40, 50 years, but folks, if people don't come in all cleaned up and dressed up, then we don't pay any attention to them. And that is not the church that I want to represent. Because that is not the church that David represented. That's not the church that Jesus represented. I want to read the text to you again that Jesus quotes out of Isaiah. And he said, today this scripture is fulfilled. God has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the broken. Proclaim liberty to captives. Recovery of sight to the blind. Set at liberty those who are oppressed, who are bound, who are jacked up and messed up, tore up what they ever did, tore it from the floor up, right? That's who Jesus came to reach. And you know, the mandate of the church hasn't changed. See, your vision and your commitment for the cave dwellers should be getting greater and greater the longer you follow Jesus. Can y'all just stay with me for a second while I rant? I don't know why people after they're saved for a while feel like they don't need to go to church no more. Feel like they don't need to go every service. When they did, when they were new converts, they were on fire. I'm going to go every service. I can't wait to get there. I'm not going to miss. But the longer they're saved, the more they back off. Why? Because church becomes about me. Y'all don't have to say amen because y'all are here. It becomes about my time, my energy, my schedule. But listen, what about the other broken cave dwellers that are here that need you? That need your testimony. That need your overcoming power that God rested on your life. What about them? I would hate it if a hundred brand new people came tonight. We wouldn't know what to do with them. We all we couldn't handle them. Two hundred people, folks. Is that what we're? That's what we're praying for. <laughs> I wouldn't hate it. I would love it. But I mean, they'd be sitting in the floors. But you know, would we be able to handle it? Would we know what we're doing, folks? We got to be committed to the cave. See, David stayed committed. He embraced the broken. He embraced the hurting. And the longer we're saved, the longer that we are following Jesus, we should be more committed. Jesus' followers shouldn't be getting less and less committed, but more and more committed. We should be able to feel, or at least, at the very least, understand the heart of God for our city. The heart of God for the lost for our co-workers, for our classmates. Jesus gave us some examples of, of the transformation that takes place in the lives of those encounters with, who encounter God. And that's what we desire in this house, is that people encounter God. Folks, I would love to preach a great sermon every time, but it just ain't going to happen because I am a sinner saved by grace. You know, and sometimes you're going to go saying, you know what, whatever. But... If God gets a hold of you, it'll never be whatever. See, it's an encounter with Jesus that changes people. Not a good sermon. Not a good worship service. It's an encounter with Jesus Christ. Oh, the sermon can convict. The worship can make you feel good. But it's that encounter with Jesus Christ that keeps you coming back. But Jesus gives us some examples of that transformation that happens the woman caught in adultery. He speaks to her and he says, go and sin no more. And she gets up. And you know, we don't get to hear the rest of her life. But I'll tell you this, you can ask her in heaven. Because Jesus spoke something in her life and she encountered a Savior. The woman at the well, we do know her story. She got saved and began to evangelize the entire city of Samaria. And the entire city came out and gave their lives to Jesus. See, it's an encounter. Have we encountered him? Not, a, not do we go to church. Have we encountered Jesus? Because when you encounter him, you can't help it. 
the Gadarene demoniac. We know that he went and he began to minister in the Decapolis. In other words, the eight cities of the region. He began to live out what he experienced in Jesus Christ. The thief on the cross. Saul of Tarsus restored by God. See, there's always a risk in the cave. Yeah, I know, I get it. People get hurt by the church, but that... That is not Jesus. You might say somebody offended me, somebody hurt me, but you can never say Jesus did that. And I'm not even saying that I won't offend you or hurt you because I'm not Jesus. We offend and we hurt each other because there's a risk in the cave. But see, it's bigger than the risk. The bigger is that we are here to win the world. The bigger is that we are here to change the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what's bigger. <laughs> Let me talk to you lastly about the work in the cave. The change that took place in Adullam was that men recaptured their identity. They recaptured their destiny. So let me just run a few, few, uh, a few things. You can write them down, listen, whatever you want to do, and I'll give you a couple of illustrations, uh, and then we'll pray tonight. But it takes years of investment, years of commitment to see the broken heart healed. There are people that have come to Jesus, been with Jesus for years, that are still suffering the rejection of a father when they were eight years old. Still suffering the rejection of a spouse who abandoned them when they were 20 and now they're 40. They're still hurting. The relationships suffer. Why? Because it takes years of investment and commitment. Listen, you got to be committed to the cave dwellers if you're going to see them find destiny. You'll have to see the potential in the wreckage of life. See, we are hard cases. Some of us were raised very difficult lives. We had very difficult upbringings, very difficult teenage years. And when we came into the church, we were, we were hard. Maybe I should speak of to myself. Hard. The problem is, the way I was, is I was hard and arrogant. Now I'm just arrogant, but uh, we won't go there. Y'all don't have to laugh. Y'all laugh too hard on that one. Um, but, you know, the reality is, is that we are very difficult, and we got a lot of unwinding to do. So it takes commitment, and it takes years of investment. See, Jesus identifies with the wreckage of life. He says these words, I was rejected by my own people. See, I don't even know if we know what that feels like. I mean, he was rejected. He was a Jew, but he was rejected by the Jews. They didn't want anything to do with him. They didn't want anything to do with his ministry, his healing, his power. And he says, I was rejected by my own. See, David was anointed to be king, but he was not king in the cave. It wouldn't have been until years later that David became king. See, restoration doesn't happen in a day. So there's great patience that needs to take place. Luke chapter 13 gives us a parable of a fig tree that would not bear fruit. I mean, this farmer's like, man, a stinking fig tree. And then he's basically like, I'm done with this stinking fig tree. I'm going to cut it down and, and, and I am going to, you know, throw it away. But his servant said, why don't you... Let me dig around it. Why don't we give it a year? Why don't we just see if we can get some fruit? See, folks, the Christian life is all about the long haul. It's not about the 100-yard dash. It's not about I went for a, a few years and, and now I don't need uh, the house of God any longer. No, it's I need God every day and I need His people in my life. 
See, the 400 men that were in the cave with David became his mighty men. See, it began in the cave. And it began being committed to the cave. 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 8, gives us a story about one of David's mighty men. These are the names of David's mightiest warriors. The first was Jashabim and Hakamite. The Hakamite, and who was leader of the three. There were three other mighty men of God that it talks about. The three mighty warriors among David's men. This man, Joshabim, I can barely say his name. He was used, he used his spear to kill 800 enemy warriors in a single battle. This man, who we don't know where he was in life when he came in the cave. Was he in debt? Was he discontented? Was he ready to give up on life? Couldn't find an opportunity to serve God? He was gifted, but never given the opportunity to walk in his giftings. David embraced the broken. And he said, you know what? God can do something with your life. God can move in your life. God can use your life. And here this man is, years later, after David had become king, he is one of David's mighty men, and he kills 800 enemy warriors in a single battle. It all began in the cave. Man of God and woman of God, listen. It all begins in the cave. It all begins in the house of God. I'm not sure why we recreate this thing like I don't need the church. I don't, need, I, don't, I don't know what Bible they read. It doesn't really matter what Bible they read because it's not the Bible that I read. Listen, the church needs one another. The cave dwellers need each other. In all of our weaknesses and failures and all of our strengths, the church needs one another. This life was not meant to be lived alone. William Booth, who was the founder of the incredible mission, the Salvation Army. Again, they don't represent what he represented today. William Booth said, while women weep as they do now, I'll fight. While little children go hungry as they do now, I'll fight. While men go to prison, in and out, in and out, as they do now, I'll fight. While there is a drunkard left, while there is a poor lost girl upon the streets, while there remains one dark soul without the light of God, I'll fight, I'll fight to the very end. His last words. I don't know if they got the picture that I sent, but William Booth was with his colleague, his disciple. This is William Booth here. <laughs> How'd you like to encounter him in a street preaching meeting? <laughs> I'd be like on my knees, like, I'm sorry, sir. But William Booth, he's looking at his disciple. His name is Bramwell. And here's what he said. And the homeless children, Bramwell, Look after the homeless. Promise me. Those are the last words of William Booth. See, he had a heart that had been revolutionized by an encounter with Jesus Christ. Another man, as I close, C.T. Studd. C.T. Studd was a missionary to China. This is what he looked in his later years, if you saw him when he was a young man, he was part of the Cambridge Seven. He was a, a, a cricket player, and they were going to go pro, and he was, uh, had millions and millions of dollars and, and very wealthy, well-to-do family in England and gave all of his money away and went to the mission field and went to China and went to India, began to preach the gospel. And here are his words. 
Some want to live within the sound of church or a chapel bell. I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. See, again, I don't know why the church culture has embraced this idea that we're anything else than a rescue shop. That we're anything else than a place where people can be restored, that destinies can be discovered, that children can find destiny in the will of God, that men and women, their marriages can be strengthened and they can make influence and impact in their communities and in their neighborhoods. I don't know why the church has bought in to this idea of big buildings and big equipment and big this and big names and popularity. And listen, all those things, whatever, whatever it is, it is. But listen, if we ever lose the truth of what we are as cave dwellers, all of us, the Apostle Paul said, if not for the grace of God, I will go the same way as every lost sinner. I will not forget where I came from and what brought me out of that. See, this is why the Apostle Paul went throughout all of Asia and Europe. What did he do? What did he do? He pioneered caves. He pioneered caves. And he said, this is a place where people can come and become cave dwellers. And then they can go out and they can give Jesus. Folks, I'm just using a metaphor of cave and cave dwellers. Hopefully it doesn't escape you. The Apostle Paul started churches where people could go to and find destiny and find purpose. This is how Silas found it. This is how Epaphroditus. This is how Timothy. All of them. All of them. Why? Because they were part. They were committed to the cave. So don't ever lose that in all the things that you do. All of the temptations of life to do something different. Yeah, there's a challenge. Yeah, there's a risk. But I'll tell you right now, there is a Christ who works in the cave. He works in the hearts of people, in the lives of people. This this quote by C.T. Studd is, I've kept it in my heart that for years I've heard this on and off throughout the years of my salvation. Some want to live within the sound of a church bell. I want to run a rescue shop within a hundred yards of hell. That is the church. That is the church. And so I want to pray uh, tonight. And I, again, I appreciate you being here taking your Sunday evening to come into this place. And why don't you bow your heads with me uh, tonight? I pray that every Christian listening to this message would be committed to coming into the house of God, whether it's here or whatever city you're in, that you would find a cave to commit yourself to and be a blessing to the people in that cave, that you would be a blessing to those who need your testimony. We have so many reasons why we can't be, but we're committed to so many things. And I don't, I am unashamed of this. And again, I'm not here to jam anybody up. I am just passionate about the church. Uh, I don't know any other thing better to be committed to than the church. I don't know anything else better to be committed to than the house of God. And yes, again, there's things. There's your marriage, obviously. There's your relationship with Christ. And uh, so what I'm talking about is being committed to people. Being committed like Jesus was. For the cross set before Him, He endured the shame. He was committed to the end. And he said, I will be with you always. I'm committed. So maybe here today, maybe God is dealing with men and women. Maybe you're watching and you want to rededicate your life to Jesus or you want to give your life to him for the first time. 
Listen, it is a dedication that you'll make and Christ will meet you right where you're at. I don't care what you've done, how bad you think you are, how unreachable you think you might be, but Jesus Christ is not intimidated by what you've dealt, done. He's not intimidated by what you've been through. He can help you. He will absolutely forgive you. All over this assembly and online as well, if you want to pray and you want me to pray for you, you want to say, yes, Pastor, pray. I want to rededicate my life to Jesus. You just lift your hand up right where you're at. I'm going to pray for you. Anyone watching, you stay with us. I'm going to pray for you as well. Anyone here, just quickly slip your hand up. Hallelujah. We're going to let God have his way. Maybe you're backslidden away from God. Your heart's not right with God. Amen. You used to be on fire. Nothing could stand in your way, but other things began to stand in your way. Maybe tonight God's challenging you. Get your heart right. Repent. Recommit your life. All over this place, maybe God is dealing with you. Listen, we're going to sing a song of worship tonight, and I want to encourage you to come to this altar. I want to encourage you to come and pray and let God speak to you. Let God touch you. Let God help you. Listen, we are called to be committed to what God is committed to. And God is committed to this house. God is committed to the house of God. He's committed to the city. He's committed. Amen. So I want to encourage you to come. Find a place to pray. Come on out of your seats and pray. The splendor of a king Clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice All the earth rejoice He wraps himself in light Darkness tries to hide, but it trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, and oh, we'll see how great. How great is our God. Oh, you move tonight, God, in this place. Age to age he stands. Time is in his hands. Beginning and the end. Beginning and the end. The Godhead three in one Father, Spirit, and Son The Lion and the Lamb The Lion and the Lamb Come on, you pray at this altar. You let God touch you. God, I want to encounter you, Lord. God, I want to be committed to you, to your heart. God, I want to be committed to what you are committed to. And thank you, Lord, for your commitment to me. Thank you for your faithfulness to me. God, I want your heart in this place. God, I pray. God, and I surrender fully my agenda. God, and I want to live for you. God, you move. God, even in this place right now, Lord. You move right here, Lord, I pray. God, as we humble ourselves to you. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. And oh, we'll see how great how great is our God. 
Why don't we stand and sing it? How great, come on. How great. See how great, how great is our God. Come on, one more time, everybody. Let your voices ring out how great. Thank you, Lord. Your love, your presence, your grace. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Folks, we're going to close in prayer, and I want to encourage you as we Obviously, aren't going to have a third message on this, but I want to encourage you to stay patient, stay committed to the cave, to the dwellers of the cave. Somebody left today and said, oh, pastor, my favorite caveman. (laughs) Listen, man, I just got the title from what David was doing in Adullam. He was in a cave on the run from a king. He was definitely not really feeling close to God as he's running as a fugitive. But then all of a sudden, he begins to be surrounded by a bunch of people just like him. And he embraces the call of God and what God is doing. And these people are raised up. Folks, that is the opportunity that the church has in the world today. Not to hold on to all that we have as pastors, but to send out into the world Just like David did his mighty men. He could have said, oh, you're a mighty man, but I ain't going to give you no opportunity. No, there's opportunity that will arise. And I want to encourage you to walk uh, in the giftings and be committed to what God is doing and what God has brought you into. And uh, and I just encourage you uh, to stay committed. Amen. Stay, stay committed uh, to the cave. I wanted to just share... A, a scripture with you, um, and I, I'm not sure exactly of the address of this scripture, but Jesus said that the zeal for the house of God has consumed him. He said, It consumes me. And I pray that in these days that we live, where everything is trying to consume us. You know, it's trying to consume our thought life and our decisions and our emotions that we allow the things of God to consume us. Whatever that may be, whether it's praying for a coworker just to be blessed or whatever it may be, I want to encourage you to be consumed with the things of God in your life. And let's watch what God will do, amen, with that zeal uh, in our life. So listen, we're going to pray. Tonight, I appreciate you. Hopefully, you're able to make it Wednesday as we fellowship together again as we say um, see you later to Abby and Adrian and um, believe God for all that he's going to do in their future and their destiny. What an exciting adventure she is walking into. Amen. We appreciate, we appreciate God. And so, heads are bowed, eyes are closed. The Lord bless you. Uh, this evening, uh, Aaron, you lift your voice, uh, pray, and you bless us as we go.